Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual first Tuesday event. And I know it's election day, and I hope you've been able to or plan to vote. It's exciting. But before introducing our speaker, I want to say thank you to those alumni and friends who've been regular attendees over these 28 years, and also welcome those who are joining us for the first time today. And I know some of you are joining from around the world. And particularly for our alumni and friends in Vienna, I just want to say that you are in our hearts today as you cope with the you know, dreadful events that have happened in your beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, coming back home, I first want to acknowledge Wells Fargo, who are long-standing sponsors of our first Tuesday speaker series. Happily, in Minnesota, we can have an event where Wells Fargo sponsors a presentation by the US Bank CEO, and at least we're not all gathering at TCF Bank Stadium. But I'm grateful that our competitors get along, have a sense of camaraderie, and are invested in the success of our region and our school. Here's our format for today. After introducing our speaker, he will present, and I will then ask him a few questions of my own before turning to you for your questions. And first, so let me tell you about my friend, Andy Cessary. He's chairman, president, and CEO of US Bank Corp, which is a financial services holding company with businesses across the United States, Canada, and Europe. And as you know, US Bank Corp is headquartered in Minneapolis and is the parent company of US Bank, which is the fifth largest commercial bank in the country, as well as of Elevon, which is a leader in the payment processing industry. Andy's career began as a financial analyst at Control Data Corporation before he joined US Bank in its finance group in 1985. He's worked his way up since then through leadership roles across the organization, including vice chairman of wealth management, vice chairman and chief financial officer, and then chief operating officer in 2015, before become, becoming president in 2016, CEO in 2017, and chairman in 2018. Andy serves on three boards, first and most importantly, the Board of Overseers for the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota, he also serves on the Board of Trustees for the University of St. Thomas and the Board of Donaldson Company Incorporated. I'm proud to call Andy our alumnus as he earned his MBA in finance from the Carlson School. And he has a bachelor's degree in business administration and finance from that other business school in Minneapolis headed by our own emerita faculty member, Stephanie Lenway, Dean of the University of St. Thomas. Did I tell you we all get along in Minnesota? Uh, on a personal note, I have learned so much from Andy's leadership. I wish I had his discipline, his photographic memory, you have to ask the folks in Vegas about that, and his incredible attention to detail. And he still does a 50 mile bike ride whenever he can. And as many of you know, Andy's a man of few words, but every word of his matters. He should really get credit in the Oxford English Dictionary for inventing the idea of de-wording documents, something I try to emulate, not very really successfully, every single day. Most importantly, however, I deeply appreciate his advice and his wisdom. He told me once, and I think he attributed it to James Gorman of Morgan Stanley, that leading an organization is like being hit by one wave, and just as you think you're emerging from it, there's another bigger one right behind it. Thanks for spending your time and sharing our, your thoughts with us today, Andy. Take it away. Thank you, Shri, for that very kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Shri, I was looking at the uh, flyer with the invitation for this and I noticed I was wearing a tie and I think that was the last time I wore a tie. It was over uh, eight months ago. I hope I remember how to tie a tie again when we get back to normal. But uh, all seriousness, I hope everyone in the audience attending today uh, wish them health and safety for both you and your family. As Shri said, this is election day and I do encourage you all to vote. I wasn't uh, thinking about that when I signed up for this over a year ago, Shri, but I would encourage you all to vote. And if you need to exit right now, I will not be offended. Please feel free to exit. You can always watch it on tape. And I also want to uh, commend Shri and the Carlson School. As Shri mentioned, I graduated from the Carlson School in 1991. 
And I tell people often that I would not have had the opportunities or career I did without the school, the education I received at both the Carlson School as well as the University of St. Thomas, and I'm thankful for that. And Shri, a special thanks to you uh, serving on the board for all you're going through at the University and the Carlson School in this very tumultuous time. You've really led uh, in an exemplary fashion and the ability to do and juggle in this, in this environment is incredibly uh, impressive, so thank you for that. I'm gonna talk about three things today. I wanna to talk a little bit about US Bank, our company. I wanna talk about the banking industry and the disruption that's occurring. And finally, I wanna spend a few minutes on the current environment and what we're facing both with COVID and some of the civil justice activities that are occurring. Let me start with the history of the company. So US Bank uh, was founded in 1863 as the first national bank of Cincinnati. So we are a 157 year old company and trace our roots back to the Lincoln administration and what started banking, which was a National Banking Act. We, in fact, are charter number 24. And President Lincoln said at that time that this new system, this new banking system would quote, create a reliable and permanent influence in support of the national credit and protect the people against losses in the uses of paper money. So it was really the establishment of banking and where we started many, many years ago. And fast forward to today, we are an international company, as Shreem mentioned, with 70,000 employees serving customers, shareholders, and communities across the United States, Canada, and Europe. This next slide uh, is one I use often in investors' uh, presentations to just give a snapshot of the company. As I mentioned, uh, founded in 19 1863, a market cap of about $60 billion. We serve our customers through 2,700 branches and 4,400 ATMs. And if you look to the right, uh, just over $400 billion in, in deposits and $300 billion in loans. As we think about the company, I describe it in three ways. First of all, in the red on the left is are the 26 states that you would see our branches and our ATMs and where we serve our consumer customers. And again, 26 uh, branches across the company, uh, uh, 26 states across the uh, country. And in fact, no bank has a, a branch in every state. There isn't, so to speak, a national bank. The highest is in the high 30. So we are one of the larger branch, we have one of the largest branch presence in banking. In the middle section, you see where we serve our corporate, commercial, wealth management, investment service customers. And that is really across the company, across the country, in every state uh, that we serve those customers in a series of uh, offices throughout the country. And then finally, on the right, international. We have a few business lines uh, internationally, principally in Europe. And the one that Shri mentioned is our merchant processing business, which is when you go to a a retail establishment or a restaurant, it's that machine that you slide your car in or, or swipe that really makes sure that the merchant gets paid from the card issuing bank and the settlement occurs without disruption. If we go to the next page, I thought it, you know, um, for thus us in banking, this is uh, pretty well known, but I thought it'd be beneficial to just share a few facts. So these are the top 10 commercial banks in the United States. And as Sri mentioned, we're the fifth largest right in the middle. And banking in the United States is a fairly concentrated business. Uh, although we have 5,000 banks across the country, which is actually quite a bit more than many other countries. For example, Canada just has a couple dozen. The fact is that if you look at the top 10 banks, uh, it's just under $8 trillion in de of deposits, which uh, is against a total deposit base of just over 15 trillion. So the top 10 banks out of 5,000 hold over 50% of the deposits in the United States. So quite a concentrated business. So what is banking? I've been at the bank for a, a fair bit and I've tried to explain this to my mom multiple times and often with failure. But uh, I'm gonna start with a definitional description of what banking is. And banking fundamentally is two things. It's financial intermediation and maturity transformation. And what does that mean? So from a financial intermediation standpoint, what that means is that we're the middlemen among diverse partners. So those who are savers or have surplus capital store their money with the bank. And those who are borrowers or are seeking capital seek money from the bank. And we're the person in between to make sure that that occurs without disruption. Secondly, we provide maturity transformation. So what does that mean? That means that uh, we can take a series of short-term deposits, a checking account, a CD, a savings account, and transform that into a long-term loan. Best example, a 30-year mortgage. And we do that through liquidity and risk management structures and tools to ensure we're doing it in a safe and sound manner for both our customers as well as the industry overall. So 
definitionally, that is what banking is. But what is banking really? What, what is it that we really do? And for this, I'm going to talk about it from a customer standpoint. Banking is, for a consumer, buying a house, buying a car, saving for retirement, paying for a vacation. It's really your financial objectives and achieving those to achieve your goals and dreams. In fact, our mission statement at US Bancorp is we invest our hearts and minds to power human potential. And we do that not just for consumers, but for businesses as well. For businesses, we provide capital and debt management for large corporations. We provide receivables and payable management, facilitate payments. We facilitate funding and capital to start a business and often serve as a trustee for bond or corporate issuances. So we have many roles, but if you step back at the highest level, banking is really important. And it's, as we call it, it's the engine and the oil, of the, it's the oil in the engine of the economy. We like to say at the bank that we don't design, build, create, or make anything, but we get behind those that do. And it is imperative that any strong economy has a strong banking system. So we take our role both from a consumer, business, and economic standpoint very seriously. So banking through the years, I'm going to talk a little bit about the disruption that's occurring. So I used to start this slide with a uh, slide from Bonanza which was a uh, Western that was uh, prevalent in the 1960s, about 1850 and 60 United States. But I found when I was doing that and I start presenting to younger students uh, at classes that nobody knew what I was talking about. So you haven't seen Bonanza for a while. So I stopped using that example and really talk about the fact that banking though from the 1860s till about 10 or 15 years ago really hasn't changed much. Most of the activity that occurred at a bank occurred within the four walls in a branch. The deposit taking, the lending activity, the, the money movement all occurred within the four walls in the bank. And that was true in the 1860s and it was true in the mid 1900s. And, and it hadn't changed much over many, many years. When I started in banking in 1985 at, at what was then first bank system, I was told that checks, branches and money would move, would start to diminish and actually go away. And for 25 years, that just wasn't true. In fact, the, the trends were the exact opposite. They were increasing across all categories. But the last five years, that has started to happen for sure. And it is about disruption. Disruptions are occurring in all of your industries, I'm sure. And disruption, as defined by Professor Clayton Christensen, displaces an existing market, industry, or technology and produces something new and more efficient and worthwhile. It is all once destructive and creative. And I think that's a terrific definition because that's exactly what's happening to the banking industry. Because today, the way individuals interact with banks is significantly different. And most of this change actually occurred within the last 10 years. And I think the best example I can give you on that is, is the way people interact. And, I, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. But the way this is changing is, is a function of um, three things. This is a function of technology, money movement, and competition. I'm gonna hit on each of those for just a minute. So first of all, from a technology standpoint, and you know, this is true not just in banking, but in many businesses of those attending the call today, I know that you are all impacted by the customer behavior changes that are occurring because of technology digital devices, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, open platforms, APIs, and most recently, speed 5G. That is all changing the dynamic of how individuals and businesses interact with banking. And one great example is this next slide, which is today, 76% of all banking transactions occur on a mobile digital device. Now think about that for a second. 10 years ago, 100% of transactions occurred within a branch and nothing occurred digitally. And today, over three quarters of that activity occurs on a digital device. It's fast, it's convenient, it's secure, it's private, and it's the way people are choosing to interact, not just in banking, but across many industries. The second thing that's changing in a dramatic way is money movement. This next slide gives a time frame of how people move money over the ages starting with the barter system and cash and coin checks, credit cards, 
and wire and ACH. And, and the checks, credit cards, wire and ACH have been around for a number of decades. But I'm putting this slide on because there is a new payment rail that has been developed. It's in the early innings, but it's gonna be quite impactful to everyone who's listening to this call. It is called Real-Time Payments or RTP. And I feel it's gonna disrupt all those other payment mechanisms in a very significant way. RTP is fast, it's secure, it's lower cost, but probably most importantly, it comes with data and information. And the transaction will have sort of auto reconciling components that will allow your accounting groups, your payables groups, your receivables groups, and individuals to individuals to transfer money in a much more, not only fast, but efficient and effective process. And it's gonna be a game changer in terms of the next few years on how money is moved and how we think about financial services. The last thing is competition. So these are some headlines of some non-bank entities entering the financial services arena. You can see Google and PayPal, Amazon, all entering banking in one way, shape, or form. And in fact, if I show you the next slide, this is actually a slide that we use with our uh, board. Every year with our board of directors, we do a, uh, a strategy offsite, just like many of you do, to talk about our key strategies. As a component of that, just like many of you, we always talk about the competition. And for years and years, as we talked about the competition, it was around the traditional banks, those banks that were on that page, the top 10 banks in the country. So JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, those are the banks we compete with and that's how we thought about competition. But the last four or five years, we expanded that substantially. And we talked not only about banks, but on the right, small FinTech providers and on the left, large tech, uh, tech platforms, the likes of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon who are all entering the banking or financial services arena. And they're doing it for three reasons. Number one is the revenue pools that go along with it. Obviously you can make money in financial services. Number two is the data that financial services allows the companies to attain. I, I tell people a lot, you think Amazon knows a lot about you. They know what you shop and what you bought every day of the year. But a bank knows all that plus where you live and what your house and what your mortgage is, when you went on vacation, are you near retirement, some of your key life events, and think of the value of that data for a data-driven company. And those are one of the influences and forces causing financial services to be extended to find, find FinTech providers. And finally, customer centrality. You know, I talked about the fact that we're in the middle of a very important decisions and components of people's lives. And a lot of these uh, technology platforms want to be in that position. They want to be close to the customer and they want to be central to the lives. And being a financial services provider allows that to occur. Now, one of the ways and the principal way that a lot of these FinTech providers and uh, financial platforms are getting into banking is through payments. And I want to explain this a little bit because I'm going to guess anyone in the audience who is 50 years old or older their first interaction with financial services or a bank was a savings account, a CD, perhaps an auto loan or a student loan or a mortgage. And that was lending and deposit taking. And deposit taking in particular is protected. It's a regulated industry. It is, there's a wide moat around it. Only banks can do that. And only banks have done that. But I'm gonna also guess if I ask anyone in the audience who's 20 years, or younger, their first interaction with financial services, it was likely payments. And it was either Venmo or Uber or Apple Pay or Zelle. And that movement of money does not have a moat around it. Anybody can do that. And the digital technology that goes along with that is the imperative to be successful. So that's where these financial services providers are, are these uh, technology platforms are entering the financial services arena and where the threat is occurring. And I would expect that to continue on in future periods. Now, what's happening is all these trends are colliding. You have the consumer trends and expectations, the technology trends, the demographic trends, again, the, the young people and the, the focus on payments and money movement, in addition to the social and economic trends. And when trends collide, that convergence actually accelerates the disruption that I'm talking about, which is exactly what's happening. When I started in banking, 
1985. On the next page, you'll see that there were 14,000, actually there were 14,567 banks in 1985. And today there are 5,000. So there was a tremendous consolidation that occurred in banking over the years. Now that consolidation occurred because there was excess capacity, there were financial uh, crisis that occurred, credit crisis, interest rate crisis, many of those occurred over time, and the importance of scale and technology started to grow. My belief is for all the reasons I just described, my expectation is those 5,000 banks on the right are going to be far fewer in the next five to 10 years, because all those aspects of the uh, disruption that are occurring are only accelerating and becoming more impactful on the industry overall. And banks have to react to that. They have to react like any company's reacting. You have to be more agile. You have to recognize the digital capabilities you need to have. You have to be more innovative and you have to be willing to change on a very quick, in a very quick fashion. And that's what's happening to US Bank. That's what's happening to the banking industry. And that's what's happening to many industries in the United States. Now, I still believe that five to 10 years from now, while there'll be fewer banks, they'll continue to be banks of all sizes. Because if you think about banking, there's a few things that will ensure our success. They are speed, convenience, and personalization. I talked about those things in the use of data and the use of information. And I talked about data as well in terms of how banks have a lot of data. What we wanna use that data for is to enhance and offer suggestions to individuals to meet their goals and objectives. We don't sell the data, we don't try to monetize it in other ways, but just for the benefit of the customers. And that's the areas we're focused on. But those last two components are tremendously important, trust and people. The fact is uh, individuals, and this is true of consumers as well as businesses, the number one reason they choose a bank, it's not location, it's not pricing, it's not product, it's trust. And if you step back and think about it, it sort of makes sense. If you're gonna put your money with someone or seek advice from someone, you wanna make sure you have that high level of trust. And the financial services industry and US Bank for sure is very focused on that. And that final component is people. You know, uh, financial services banking is a complicated subject. And if, if you don't study that in school, it, it can be very complex. And because of that, banking will continue to be a people business. And that's true for both consumers and, and businesses overall. And while we have transactions that occur in a uh, digital fashion, if you want advice, if you want counsel, if you want a direction, oftentimes people wanna sit across from someone else, ask questions, get that consultation and advice in a personal way. So I think the magic of banking and the magic of our success will be this combination of great digital capabilities combined with that human touch and that human element and really marrying those two in a, in a seamless comprehensive way to serve all the needs of the, the, of the customers we serve. So I wanna now shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, what's happening with COVID and, uh, and the reactions that we've had. So just like many of you, uh, for me, uh, COVID started on March 11th and within a matter of two weeks, we were able to move 75% of our staff, of our 70,000 employees to work from home. And you think about that, if we were going to undertake that as a project, it would have probably taken years and we were able to do it in two weeks, just like many of you. And it's a, really a, a credit to the entire team and the leadership group at the bank, as well as the, the employees. And uh, we've been in that mode ever since. But I will tell you that uh, the, the indications and the data that we're seeing are very um, inconsistent and a little bit confusing to tell you the truth versus what we see from a macroeconomic standpoint. So in an environment where we have uh, seen 13% unemployment, negative 30% GDP, many businesses closed, shut down, and many uh, are filing for bankruptcy, in that environment, our credit stats are some of the best we've ever seen. Our consumers spend, which we have a large payments business, is almost back to normal, except for certain industries like you would expect airlines and the like. Consumer delinquencies or the credit, the ability to pay are at all time positive stats. And it's, it's fascinating. Our, our early stage and late stage delinquencies are at all time lows for the last 30 years. 
So why is that? Why is it we're having this very difficult environment where we're seeing such good credit stats? And I attribute it to both the uh, stimulus package that occurred, and I think the Fed, the Treasury, and Congress did a terrific job acting very rapidly to get the stimulus out there to help businesses and consumers. And the forbearance programs that all the banks put in place to extend, forgive, or lower fees. And banks, unlike the last financial crisis, are actually in a much stronger and better position and are, are trying to be part of the solution in this uh, downturn. And they're working closely together with all our consumers to make sure we're doing anything we can to help them through this very difficult time. Now, the Fed and, and the Treasury, you know, in a matter of a few weeks, increased their balance sheet from $4 trillion to $7 trillion. And that was liquidity provided to the market that built this bridge. If you think about the last financial crisis, uh, it took years to build that $3 trillion, and this took weeks. So what they did in years, they did in weeks, and that was really beneficial. And the way I think about it is this uh, stimulus package that's out there, the forbearance plans by the banks have created this bridge over very troubled waters that the consumers are currently able to walk on. And I think it's critically important that there is another stimulus because at some point the bridge will end. And what we don't want to happen is for the bridge to end before we're all the way over the water. So a second stimulus and helping particularly small businesses in stressed industries, I think is gonna be critically important. So that's what's happening with the consumer. And then if I look at the business side, it is truly a tale of two sides. It is a K recovery. There are a number of industries, and you're all very aware of them, that are, that are uh, impacted quite heavily in a negative sense. So the airline industry, lodging, travel and entertainment, and certain retailers that are dependent on physical forms of distribution. To their credit, those companies have built their balance sheet, increased their liquidity, and are really fortifying to get them through this difficult time. At the same time, we have a number of other industries that are actually having record quarters in terms of sales and revenues, and are really benefiting from these changes in consumer behaviors that are occurring, and they're at all-time positives. So as I said, if I step back and think about this, the data against the macroeconomic scenario and what we're seeing from our customers is a little bit inconsistent, but I think it goes back to that stimulus plan and how important that is for the customers we serve. And finally, I didn't want to let this uh, presentation go by with talking a little bit about uh, uh, the social justice activity that's occurring, particularly for us in the Twin Cities. Um, so DEI has always been a tremendous focus for our company, but Certainly, and I know for a lot of those on the phone, this increased in intensity and focus. And we're focused on three areas. Number one is our employees to making sure we have an environment that regardless of your background, your race, or your gender, you have the opportunity to advance within the company. We're very focused on creating programs and vehicles to allow that to happen. Second, for our customers, uh, you know, uh, what we do in banking is help meet financial objectives. I talked a lot about that. And we're working on initiatives to close the uh, racial wealth gap, to allow capital access to small businesses, to increase supply activity uh, um, for those who provide businesses to us for minority businesses. So it is a tremendous focus for us. And finally, the communities we serve. You know, with, uh, with the riots that occurred um, in South Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, our brand, uh, we had three of our branches destroyed and we committed to rebuilding because we know how important it is to have that location and that service in the, both on Lake Street as well as on West Broadway and we're going to continue to be committed to those communities in the long term. So it's an interesting time to be in banking. It's an interesting time to be at U.S. Bank. I want to again thank you all for your part your listening. And Tree, I hand it back to you for questions. Thank you, Andy. That was very very interesting. And thank you also for the shout out to the Fed. So that's. Uh, <laughs> You know, we're all interested in making sure that the economy stays strong and that it's an economy that works for all of us. Uh, I was very intrigued by some of some of the things you said about technological disruption and especially the sort of the competition between the apples and the oranges, if you will, in, in this space. And how, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that we are concerned about, you know, both at the Fed and, you know, and, and generally is that you know, there is there is still a significant unbanked population, even in the United States. And how do we bring them in? Will this, these technological developments help in that process? Are banks like yours doing other things to try and reach out to the unbanked? I would love to hear a little more about that in your, uh, from you. 
Thanks, Rhea. And you know, that, that's a good question. In fact, that was a focus before uh, COVID and it only has accelerated in intensity afterwards. We have uh, created actually a couple of products for people entering the banking system who are currently outside of the banking system. We have a product called Simple Loan, which is a digitally accessed product that is a replacement for payday lenders at a much lower cost. And it allows people to get into the banking system and hopefully graduate to other products as they enter and build credit scores and build credit history. We have a safe debit product that is a, a product on the deposit side without overdraft fees at a very low fee that is a debit only that allows people to again enter the banking system. So I think digital access actually increases the opportunity for those who are unbanked to enter the banking system that coupled with the products that we're trying to develop to allow that to happen. No, I mean, in this context, I know that Congress is also kind of pushing uh, sort of to offer free bank accounts, you know, whether, you know, through the, whether through the Fed or whether through uh, the post office to, uh, to the underbanked. And, but, you know, such a free system is likely to sort of, you know, uh, affect the ability of banks like yours, again, to be, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, would probably take some customers away from you. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that or any? Yeah, so, you know, uh, on our simple loan product, we actually priced it, Sri, to make zero money. Uh, we, we're not making money on that product. We're doing it to allow people to enter the, the, the banking system and to offer them alternative to payday lenders. Uh, you know, the problem with it is it, it's still more expensive than a typical lending product because the losses are higher, but we're not making any money on it. And the objective, again, is to bring people in so they can graduate to other products and services. Sure. I think that's, that's fantastic. It's great to hear. And if there's anything that as a university we could help you with, I mean, I'd, we'd love to be able to do that. Uh, you know, the other things that I am uh, interested in is, you know, COVID-19, I think, has accelerated all of us in this uh, headlong move into technology and other methods of uh, delivery and so on. And I'm just wondering, do you see any long term changes in what might happen in the industry as a result of this? Right. So, Sri, you know, we, we actually started this digital push about three years ago to try, you know, recognizing the consumer behavior trends and the way people were interacting was changing. And I would say COVID, if anything, accelerated that in a great way, uh, in a tremendous fashion. So I think it's going to really move this forward faster and, and certainly in a more permanent way. If you think about the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, we're able to uh, issue over 100,000 loans, $7 billion, completely in a digital fashion in a very short time frame. We and other banks, over $500 billion in total. So that's an example of uh, just a new way of doing business. And I would expect that the trends that I talked about are only going to be accelerated. The other thing I'll tell you, the uh, probably the, one of the unexpected outcomes of COVID is, is the employee workforce mm -hmm. and how the workforce changes will occur over the long term. So as I mentioned, you know, before COVID, we had maybe five or 10% of our staff working from home. We now currently are at 75%. And our expectation over the long term is that maybe uh, 10 to 20% will work from home on a full-time basis, 10 to 20% will work uh, in the office on a full-time basis, but there's gonna be this great number in the middle that are gonna be a hybrid approach because there are certain activities that you can do on your own from home, but you might be in days, during the week, weeks during the month where you have to collaborate and work with others. And, and that workforce dynamic is probably one of the unexpected, but also um, recurring themes that we're talking about and will continue to be important on a go forward basis. And I think that's gonna affect all our industries, including ours. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, there are tons of questions from the audience. But I, so I'll just ask you one more quick question. And that is, you know, we have nearly 500 of our Carlson School alumni working at, the U U at US Bank. And I know every year you've been one of our biggest uh, recruiters for interns as well. And uh, so I think we have more than 30 interns even in the last uh, most recent years. So what kind of skills are you looking for as you hire our students? What should we be preparing them for as we think about how banking is going to evolve in the future? Yeah, Shri, in fact, we, uh, we uh, like everyone else, uh, migrated to a virtual internship this last summer. We had over 400 interns, uh, 66 from uh, University of Minnesota, which 33 from the Carlson School. So I have a, a very soft place in my heart from both the Carlson School and St. Thomas, and we, uh, we, we try to accommodate as many as we can. You know, I think there are three characteristics that we always look at when I talk to the students, I talk about these three. Number one is communication. Regardless of what job you're in, 
or what function you have, being able to communicate either verbally or written is so important. And communicating with each other, with large groups, with your managers, that communication skill. And I find that to be a particular strength of those from the University of Minnesota at the Carlson School. The second is collaboration. Uh, you know, one of the things I find, particularly from schools in the Midwest, is the ability to work in teams well together. And that collaboration, which I talked a little bit about uh, in terms of this new hybrid approach, is going to be so important on the school forward basis. And having that skill set, I think, is, is really important. And the final C is curiosity. Uh, I always tell people, whatever you're doing, understand why you're doing it. Understand what happened before you did it and what happens after you do it. And I find the Carlson School students also have a particular skill in that as well. Love that. Communication, collaboration, and curiosity. And I, I might steal that from you sometime. But with that, I think I'll turn it over to Amy. I know we have more than 30 questions that people want to ask. So we'll try and get through uh, as many as we can. And for the I, rest- I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to de-word here to get that done, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, lots of questions coming in. So we'll uh, start with some of them and try to get to as many as possible. Um, one of our attendees asked, thank you for the fabulous and informative presentation. I'm wondering about two things. First, how do you feel about the new forms of money that are coming forward and what do they mean for banking? And second, given all the changes, what is the future of all your employees in the branches in terms of work? Thank you for both questions. So uh, I do think there's going to be, a, I've already talked about the new payment rail, the real-time payment system that it will uh, ultimately take away a lot of what's happening with uh, cash and currency, uh, checks, wire ACH, and I do think that's going to take place. If the question around currency is uh, more digital cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin and the like, I am less uh, convinced that that will replace traditional currency in, in particularly in the United States. Uh, I am a big believer in a distributed ledger and, um, and the fact that uh, blockchain has a huge opportunity within banking. And anytime you have many to many and you need to switch in between something like that with information flow can be quite valuable. But the cryptocurrency component, given its anonymous nature and given the regulatory framework that we have in the United States, I think is going to be a higher hurdle for taking over uh, traditional dollars. In terms of the branch, uh, that's a good question as well. So one of the hardest parts of this transformation and disruption that's occurring is the uh, human impact. And as many of you know, we announced um, about two weeks ago that we were reducing the number of branches that we have uh, across the, the, our footprint. And that's really a, a in response to the changes in consumer behaviors that I'm talking about. But what we're very focused on is reskilling and retraining. And our hope is the great majority of those who are no longer going to work in a branch work in other areas in the company. And we have a very intense focus on that um, for the company overall led by our HR group to try to reskill, retrain into other opportunities. We're uh, actually adding staff in our call centers and our digital activities in PPP forgiveness. And all those things are seeking employees and we're really trying to shift and accommodate as many as we can. Great, thank you. Um, you Andrew asks, with such high regulation within banking since 2008, how do you expect regulations to increase, decrease, or stay the same? How will that affect the performance of the bank and operational excellence? So, you know, um, you will never hear me, and I, I never will, I hope, uh, complain about regulation. I think uh, we are, the regulatory agencies that, uh, that we work with, the OCC, the Fed, the CFPB, and the FDIC, all have an important role. And as I talked about, uh, you know, critical to a strong economy is a strong banking system. You need to have a safe and sound banking system. And I think that the regulators in place today are, are thoughtful, they're balanced, and we're trying to figure out ways to retain that safety while at the same time serving the customer. So I, I, you know, I think we have a good balance in terms of regulation. That's my perspective. Um, and I think that the regulators in place now uh, are listening they understand their mission, they understand our mission, they're trying to find that right balance. Thank you. Um, we have a listener who is asking, what is keeping you up at night? It's a good question. You know, um, one of the interesting aspects of banking with the new digital activities that are occurring in cloud computing and such is cybersecurity. So, you know, you're often taught 
in school when I was uh, in banking school uh, and when I took banking at the uh, Carlson School, that the number one risk in banking always has been and always will be credit risk. And if you think about it, it is a, it's a big number. Um, you know, we might have credit losses in the billions of dollars in any particular year. I happen to think that if not uh, exceeding that, or at least close to it, is, is cyber risk. Because the new form of bank robbery isn't at a branch anymore. It's getting into your data and breaches and stealing from your company from an electronic method. So cybersecurity is, uh, is one of my top concerns. The banking industry is very focused on it. And the banking industry probably is uh, one of the better in terms of working together on making sure that we're controlling threats to the industry and individually. If uh, a large bank uh, today gets a uh, threat, I will know from, the, uh, from the, what IP address that's coming from shortly and I'd be able to shut it down here at US Bank because of the collaboration that occurs. But uh, organized crime, nation states, and uh, bad guys are focused on breaching and cyber and that continues to be a huge uh, weight on my mind. Thank you. Our next question is, what role do you see for minority owned and community banks in the future financial services ecosystem? Yeah, that, that's, uh, when we talked about community and we talked about uh, some of the initiatives we have underway, we're actually working with some uh, minority owned community banks. There are very few, it's, 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 uh, there, there aren't enough and there need to be more. And there needs to be more and there needs to be support from some larger banks, which we're working on as well as the capital to allow that to occur. So I do think that's important. I think that's important to the communities we serve and it's an area of emphasis for us. And we're actually partnering through a treasury program with a couple of minority owned banks to allow that to occur. Great, thank you. How does US Bank differentiate themselves in the market relative to the closest two or three competitors? Yeah, that's a good question. So a couple of things, um, I won't go back to the chart, but you'll see uh, we're, um, from, a, from an asset size perspective, we're about one fourth the size of the bank above us, or we're about half as valuable. And the reason for that is we have very high returns. And we have very high returns because of return on equity, return on assets, because of the business mix we have. And we have a particular emphasis on our payments business. So if we do a slice of the pies of uh, the revenue sources of the bank, about 29, almost 30% of our revenue derives from payments which is rather unique in banking. So that area where we're, it's both a threat and an opportunity where a lot of the consumers are entering banking and where a lot of the threats are coming is in payments and we have a large presence there. Uh, the second fact is I talked about that trust and safety component and how important that is in banking. We happen to be the number one rated bank in the United States and with one rated agencies across the globe. So having that rating, that debt rating, which is in a, a third party, um, determination that we are a safe and sound institution is hugely important to our success. Thank you. Other than less branches, what other changes are needed from the physical location to say relevant to customers? Well, you know, it, uh, it, it isn't so much the physical location, it's being able to bring together the people and the digital capabilities. And it, it's a function of three things, I think. One is, is digital, having it available, convenient, fast and, and certain, that's number one, and safe, right? Secondly is using that data. I talked about the data and using that for your benefit. So Shri, if you have a series of payments and we could offer you insights that, you know, here's a, perhaps a, a loan that you could get that would be a lower cost, or here's an opportunity if you set a savings goal on a way you could go about it, offering you that insight via data. And then, and then finally that people component that I talked about, that human uh, touch. And, and really making those three come together in a seamless way, I think, is the critical success factor. Thank you. What did you do to continue to refresh your skill set to remain relevant with the company from 1985 to present? Yeah, you make me sound so old. Um, so <laughs> uh, I guess that's because I am old. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, banking has been a dynamic industry and changing a lot, particularly in the last 10 years. And uh, as a result of that, we've actually had a number of uh, entrants into the banking system and into U.S. Bank from other industries, uh, people from the technology industry, healthcare, aerospace, defense, and, uh, you know, collaborating with them on the changes they're seeing in their industry has been uh, very, very positive. 
And I will also tell you our board of directors has been a very positive influence also because we have a very diverse board from many different industries that are faced with some of the same disruption factors that I talked about banking is faced with. And hearing how they've handled it, some of those are large tech platforms and how they're thinking about it has been a, a, a real help. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Vienna. It says, trust is the cornerstone of banks to attract depositors. However, fintechs are catching up very fast. Here in Europe, due to negative interest rates, people are moving to fintechs. How do you see the European banking ecosystem competing with those, with fintechs? That's a great question. And thank you for that from Vienna. Uh, you know, we actually uh, did a roadshow to Europe uh, as well as Asia to talk about what we're seeing in other countries. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, they're probably ahead of us. So many European countries have already uh, migrated away from checks and currency. They have already fewer branches and they uh, do have negative interest rates and in fintech competition. Even in those scenarios though, what you, when you talk to the individuals that run those banks, they'll tell you the same thing I'm uh, telling you today, which is it's that combination. You can't have just one. You have to have the digital capability, you have to have the people capability and the trust, and you have to have those factors I talked about that are keys to success. So you can't just have one, you have to have all three. The other thing I would say, uh, you mentioned negative race, and just to comment on that, uh, I don't anticipate uh, that to be a scenario, at least uh, in the foreseeable future for the US for two reasons. Number one is uh, some of the comments from the Fed regarding that is all, that, you know, there are other alternatives that they would put in place first, and they've already done. And secondly, I'm not sure that the European model for negative rates has been that successful in terms of outcomes. So for those reasons, I don't see that as a high probability, at least in the near term. Thank you. Um, you talked sure. about technology driving change. What are the key technology areas the bank is investing in today, and why are you making those investments? Yeah, you know, it's across the bank. And I, I would, if I would have answered this question a year ago, I would have talked about our, our agile studios. And at the time we had maybe 50 studios, which changed the way we develop. But now we're doing everything this way. And, and I'll tell you the way it used to work and the way it now works for a bank. So the way we would develop a new product is a product manager would have an idea. And they develop the product uh, characteristics and, and details and, and requirements. They toss it off over the wall to the technology group. Technology would code it, they test it, then they test it over back to the product group. We put it out in a, in a sort of a user test process. We find out the customer maybe didn't want exactly what we thought they wanted, and we start all over again. By the time we started till we finished, it might have been a year in terms of development. The way we develop now is through agile studies and agile processes, which we have everyone around the table. So the customer is around the table with product and technology and risk management. And we're all developing on the fly. And we're starting with the minimal viable product and then enhancing from there, much like those tech platforms do. So we've learned a lot over the last few years in terms of changing completely the way we're developing, the way we handle our technology and the way we're thinking about customer and customer interaction. Great, thank you. Um, someone is asking more about your personal experience. Did you seek outside experience or experience in other industries at any time and then return to U.S. Bancorp? Uh, as Sri mentioned in my introduction, I, uh, uh, I graduated in 1982 from the uh, University of St. Thomas and started uh, working at Control Data, which was a large technology company at that time. It was one of the largest companies in, in the Twin Cities from 1982 to 85. But since 85, I've been at U.S. Bank and a U.S. bank, just uh, when I started in 1985, was first bank system was about $20 billion in assets. And today it's uh, over $550 billion in assets um, across 26 states, across the globe, actually. And it has been a wonderful organization to be a part of. And I'm very proud uh, for everything we've been able to do over the last many years. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if this is, it's a little, um, we'll ask you, what does, <laughs> does the bank have a time frame or metric when employees will go back to the headquarters in downtown? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. We spent some time on that this morning. And so we articulated that we do not expect a large scale return to office until at least January. And we did that about two or three months ago. We also have a set of criteria having to do with uh, number of cases, uh, schooling, and uh, the ability for people to find uh, 
childcare. So we also said we're gonna give a 30 day notice and we're coming upon uh, a 30 day notice if we wanna come back in January and we're actually d discussing that right now. You know, given some of the current trends, we probably will delay further, but we're still, we're still assessing. But we do not have a firm date as of yet. Thank you. What kind of competitive disadvantages or disadvantage do you face with regard to non-traditional market uh, participants, maybe Google or another FinTech? That's an excellent question. So, you know, one of the things about uh, bankers, uh, so, so when we book loans through a, through a cycle, we have a 1% loss rate. So uh, that's, that's, that's what you need to have in banking to be successful, 1% loss rate. So 99% of the time you have to be right. So we as bankers have been sort of conditioned over time to only make decisions when we're 99% right. You can't do that in this environment. You have to be able to experiment, quickly fail, adjust, just like I talked about the technology. So one of the uh, aspects is cultural. And we have to be willing to make many small bets take some losses, adjust and move forward and not expect to be 99% right. And that is a, a little bit of a banking cultural aspect that needs to adjust to be able to compete effectively with some of the FinTech players. Great, thank you. We've got time for one further question and we've gotten this a couple of times. Um, what technical skills is US Bank looking for right now in hiring? Yeah, so you know, um, one of the great things about having a company with 70,000 jobs is whatever you want to do, you can do at U.S. Bank. If you want to work with people or on your own, if you want to work with numbers or finance or accounting or technology or digital initiatives, you can do that. If you want to work days or nights, wherever you want to work. So we have jobs across every category and many of those categories are actually growing and expanding. That's great. I mean, thanks, Andy. This is a, you know, wonderful discussion. And I know there are a lot more questions in our Q and A uh, uh, set, and perhaps we'll just send them to you. And you know, if you if you have time, you know, we'd love to see you know if if you could respond to some of them. Absolutely. Or send them back to us, we will make sure that it gets to the people who ask the questions. So thank you for that. Thank you, Shree. And uh, you know, we I'll remember about communication and collaboration and curiosity and make sure our students have all of that to come and work for US Bank. And uh, thank you for just being such a strong presence in our community. I have to say that at the Carlson School, we've been fortunate that we've been able to invest in technology and it's been very, very helpful for us as we transition to COVID in no small part due to a, 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 a very generous grant that the US Bank had given us to invest in technology in the classroom. So thank you again for that too.